I'm Paul Kennedy. Welcome to Ideas. Nervous about the economy? Well, who isn't, really? And that's the thinking behind the latest Monk debate held at Roy Thompson Hall in Toronto. The time, the evening of November 14th, 2011, in front of a full house. And the question, be it resolved, North America faces a Japan-style era of high unemployment and slow growth. Do you agree or disagree? The evening really was a referendum on the strength or weakness of the American economy. Those assembled to discuss this naughty problem were quite a distinguished group, as is the custom in these monk debates. On the pro side, yes, were Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Krugman and David Rosenberg, a Canadian financial strategist. On the con side, disagreeing with the pessimistic outlook, were former U.S. Secretary of the Treasury Lawrence Summers and consultant and author Ian Bremmer. Now let's hear some highlights from the event. The evening's debate was moderated by Rudyard Griffiths, who will further introduce the panelists. Let me briefly introduce our debaters to this audience. Paul Krugman is the 2008 Nobel Laureate for Economic Sciences. His highly influential New York Times column is a must read for anyone interested in US politics and economics. In addition to his massive body of scholarly work, 20 books and 200 papers, but who's counting, Paul? He is the author of numerous best-selling books, including The Return of Depression Economics and the Crisis of 2008. Equally important to us tonight, Dr. Krugman has a long-standing interest and policy engagement with the causes and consequences of Japan's lost decades. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Krugman. Now, Canadian David Rosenberg definitely has the hometown advantage coming into tonight's debate. He is the ubiquitous chief economist and strategist at the Toronto-based wealth management firm Gluskin Chef and Associates. Prior to joining Gluskin Chef, David was the chief North American economist at Bank of North America. And since David's too modest to say it, I will. He is one of only a handful of economists to predict both the anemic pace of the post-crisis recovery and the recent reversal in stock valuations. Ladies and gentlemen, David Rosenberg. Now, on to our con debaters. Ian Bremmer is an acclaimed author and the founder and head of the Eurasia Group, the world's leading global risk research and consulting firm. Two of his internationally best-selling books are especially important to tonight's debate. The J-Curve, a new way to understand why nations rise and fall, and The End of Free Markets, Who Wins the War Between States and Corporations. Ian writes a regular column on geopolitics for the Financial Times of London and the influential The Call blog for foreign affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, Ian Bremmer. Now, our final debater tonight was hailed by the Globe and Mail this weekend as being to the economics profession what previous monk debater Henry Kissinger is to the practice of international diplomacy. He is one of America's most respected economists, having published widely in the areas of public finance and macroeconomics. His public service career spans a variety of posts, as chief economist to the World Bank, U.S. Treasury Secretary under Bill Clinton, the president of Harvard, and most recently, the head of Obama's influential national, the, recently the head of Obama's influential National Economic Council, Ladies and gentlemen, Lawrence Summers. As we've agreed with our debaters, I'm going to call on them now for their opening statements in order. And Mr. Krugman, I'm going to start with you. You have six minutes, sir. Okay. So let me start with a, uh, a judgment. If 95% of the audience says that they're open-minded, at least 50% are lying. Um, <laughs> Also, I've been asked, uh, if this, this is about North America. It's all going to be about the United States. I apologize for that. Canada doesn't really fit in for two reasons. One, it's small, 
And uh, second, it has not messed up enough to be interesting. So, uh, <laughs> so this is going to be a US-centered discussion. With that, um, let me say, I, I actually find it quite strange at this point that people are still wondering whether things can go as badly in the United States as they have in Japan. Because uh, the fact is that the things in the United States have already gone much, much worse than they ever did in Japan. Um, it's actually quite startling to look back at what Japan's troubles are, and they're real, uh, but Japan never had the kind of drastic slump in employment that has afflicted the United States. Uh, it never had a decline in real GDP comparable to that that the United States is experiencing until, uh, until the world as a whole went into crisis in, in 2008. Uh, so the US has, has had a very bad start already, much worse than anything Japan has had. Uh, will the United States quickly recover from this shock? Uh, well, it's too late for that, right? We're, we're now already, uh, it's already four years since the Great Recession began. And, uh, you know, are, are we feeling prosperous yet? And there's no sign, there's not even a hint in what's going on in the U.S. right now that, that a V-shaped recovery, the kind of thing that people kind of hoped would happen, is, is, is beginning, is in the offing, uh, is even in the horizon. Uh, for the past two and a half years, the U.S. has been basically in a holding pattern. Uh, growing, but not fast enough to make any significant dent in unemployment, which remains very high. It's a, it's a not collapsing, but a sour economy. And that's, that's what a lost decade looks like. That's what Japan has been all this period, except that the United States is sourer and loster uh, during this period than Japan ever was. Now, Japan took a long time to get as bad as it is right now. The, the Nikkei, if you go back to the 90s, the Nikkei was above 15,000 for almost all of that decade, so it, you know, give, give us time. But also you can say that America was a lot more vulnerable to falling asset prices uh, because of our households never saved much in the, in, in the first place. And, and ultimately, you have to judge these things uh, on a PPE basis. Uh, that's proof of the pudding is in the eating. <laughs> all, everything you see says that the United States had a bigger shock to its economy than Japan did when its bubble burst. One other thing to say, for the first 15 years of its lost decade, Sorry about that, but Japan's lost decade is now in its 19th year. Um, Japan had the great advantage of being pretty much unique in its economic woes, so that it could, to some extent, pull itself out by exporting to a more prosperous rest of the world. And I've looked back, as far as I can tell, every financial crisis uh, since, since World War II, the co countries have recovered basically by having an export boom, by moving into a large trade surplus against the rest of the world that was doing okay. Uh, this time around, we're all in this. So the United States can't pull itself out by running a trade surplus unless we can find another planet to sell to. So what is it, that, what is it about the American situation that would make you think that we're going to do any better, that we're not going to have a lost decade? There is the claim that America is a more dynamic and creative society uh, than Japan, uh, which is arguably true, but that was also true of America in the 1930s. We were very dynamic and very creative, and it still took the war to actually end the Depression. Mainly, though, what I hear is the claim that American policy uh, has been or will be better than Japan's. And my basic answer to that is, say what? I mean, all right, look, the Fed, my former department head, Ben Bernanke, was quicker on the draw than his uh, predecessors at the Bank of Japan, but it, he dropped interest rates to zero, and that quickly, but that obviously wasn't enough. That happened three years ago. Arguably, America's done a better job at not perpetuating zombie banks, but actually, if you were serious in analyzing Japan, you knew that that issue was, was greatly overrated in, from the first place. Fiscal policy, which is arguably what can be most effective, uh, well, we criticize Japan a lot for having stop-go, for having stimulus programs that were inadequate, and then pulling them back before the economy was really on, on the road to recovery. We've done the same thing. Uh, U.S. fiscal policy has turned strongly contractionary at this point, with the, with the Obama stimulus fading out and state and local governments co just continuing to contract. Uh, so if you want to believe that America's going to do better, you have to believe that we're going to reach a consensus on stronger, more effective policy action. You have to believe that the American political system is heading towards that kind of effective consensus. And I guess the question is, looking at American politics, what would make you think that it's heading towards a consensus for effective action? What would even make you think it's heading towards sanity? And, uh, you know, the, this morning's polls, Newt Gingrich has pulled into the lead for the Repub Republican nomination. So I see absolutely no reason to believe that J America will do better than Japan. Thank you.
Well done, Mr. Krugman. Exactly on time. Larry Summers, we'll see if you can follow that example. Paul, I would buy, not sell. You're right. The United States has a serious demand deficiency. You're right that not enough is being done to contain that demand deficiency. You're right that we will suffer needless unemployment and stagnation until more is done to address that demand deficiency. You're right in what you have written, and this is an analogy that you and I have shared, quoting Keynes. Keynes famously described Britain's problems as a magneto problem. That was British speak circa 1931 for a problem with the electrical system of your car. And his point was that if your car wouldn't go and you fixed the electrical system, then it would, and you didn't have to engage in a fundamental and far-reaching critique of your car. You just had to fix what was wrong. And when an economy like the United States is demand short, you just have to fix what is wrong and move to strengthen demand. My thesis is that as serious as that problem is, it is dimensionally much less than the problems that Japan faced in four respects. Japan's problems were different of magnitude, different in the depth of their structural roots, different in the relative perspective they had relative to the rest of the world, and different in the degree of resilience their system had for adapting to them. Magnitude. Let's get the magnitude straight. In Japan, house prices fell to a level not two-thirds of previous levels, but a level 15% of previous levels. The stock market may get there, but to get where it got in Japan, you'd have to be talking about Dow 2600, and I don't think that is in prospect. Paul, you forecast in 1994, and it was very close to the kinds of estimates that the Clinton administration had, the Japanese potential GDP growth would be 3% or a bit more. By that standard, Japan is now producing half of what the potential output that people were forecasting when its lost decade uh, began. That's much, that's a problem of a different magnitude than a U.S. gap, serious though it is, at six or seven percent. And little wonder that Japan's slowdown is so profound, given the magnitude of the structural problems that hold Japan back. The most rapidly aging society in the industrialized world, resulting in slow labor force growth. Epic insularity and inability to accept uh, immigration, and in the face of distress, a massive retrenchment by its companies to their home markets and receding from the world, and an utter lack of capacity for entrepreneurial innovation in the era of the social network. The United States remains, witness my colleague here, the only country in the world where you can raise your first $100 million before you buy your first suit and tie. Relative, you're taking my time, Re relative perspective. When Japan went wrong in the 1990s, the world was working. The United States was flourishing and growing. Europe was flourishing and growing. It was Japan that was having a substantial reduction in its share of the GDP of the industrialized world. It's very different now. The United States' problems are the problems of every industrial democracy. And the U.S. share of the industrial world's output is steadily increasing. The capacity, there's plenty that's wrong with the U.S. political system. But if you look at eight prime ministers in as many years in Japan, if you look at what passes for governance in uh, Europe in recent years, I would suggest that our problems do not loom large 
relative to either the economics or to the politics compared to what's happening in the rest of the world. We remain totally unlike Japan, the place where everyone in the world wants to come and the place where everyone in the world wants to put their money. And finally, we are a uniquely resilient society. We have seen this before. People thought John Kennedy died believing that Russia would surpass the United States by the early 1980s. Every issue of the Harvard Business Review in 1991 proclaimed that the Cold War was over and Japan and Germany had won, and that was before the best decade in U.S. economic history. It will take time. There are steps that need to be taken. But we are a society that works. We are a society whose principal problems, we all up here agree, can be addressed by a change in the printing of money and the creation of infrastructure. That is not the kind of fundamental problem Japan has. Well, Lawrence, I see your time at the MIT Debating Club uh, University is paying off here again perfectly on the six-minute mark. David, will you make it a trifactor for us? Probably David not. Rosenberg, ladies Probably and gentlemen. Probably not. <laughs> Thank you. Well, my uh, colleague and partner, uh, Paul Krugman, said that the uh, proof of the uh, pudding is in the eating, uh, and that certainly resonates because what's the proof is this. The proof is that despite the fact that we have had three years of unprecedented and radical stimulus in the economy, I mean, as you already heard, we've had policy rates in the US at zero. Zero percent policy rates for three years. Who was calling for that four, five, six, seven years ago? We have had the Fed take its balance sheet into the stratosphere. It was once an $800 billion stable balance sheet is now two and a half trillion dollars. And we've had at the same time three years of government deficits in the US at the federal level of over 10% of GDP. I mean, FDR never ran the deficit above 6% of GDP for one year in the New Deal. We've had three years of unprecedented fiscal stimulus. And yet, what did we get out of it? What did we squeeze out of the lemon was real GDP growth of barely more than 2% at an average annual rate. And then you take a look historically at what's normal. What is normal in the context of a post-World War II, post-recession recovery, nine quarters in where we are today? And the answer is 5.5%. We've averaged barely more than two, despite the most radical government incursion into the economy and the capital markets that we've ever seen. So it almost drums up, you know, Billy Joel, is that all you get for your money? Uh, if this was a normal garden variety business cycle with that degree of stimulus, we'd actually have GDP growth running at an 8.5% annual rate, and we'd be talking about hyperinflation. But that's not what happened. And what makes this actually similar, and it's not exactly the same, it's not fair to debate, is it the same as Japan? No two cycles or two experiences are, are the same. What this is telling you, despite all these policy tailwinds and the lack of above potential GDP growth that's left the unemployment rate around 9% for 30 months now, is the fact that our policymakers are bumping against these severe headwinds, otherwise known as the debt deleveraging cycle. And also the fact that we still have a depression in housing four years after the initial detonation. But we have a consumer debt deleveraging in the United States of unprecedented proportions. Unprecedented. We had what was a 40-year secular credit expansion that went absolutely parabolic in 2002 because we had a government that believed that as an antidote to a bursted dot-com bubble, we can actually save the system by engineering a financial and housing bubble. And so 
That is the basic problem that we have in our hands, is the largest component of the global economy called the U.S. household sector, 70% of GDP, is trying desperately to get out of debt. How do you get out of debt? Well, you either pay it down, which comes at the expense of other spending, or you walk away from it, okay? You default. Either way, a credit deleveraging cycle, and we have not had this situation at any other time in the post-World War II period. You have to go back almost into previous centuries. What does it mean? It means the pay down of debt. It means rising savings rates. It means reorienting the family budget from luxury goods and services towards necessities. It means rising savings rates, and it means a weak economic backdrop, and it is fundamentally deflationary. What did Japan go through? Japan went through an asset bubble that burst. I'm not going to try and get into the parameters as to what was bigger and what was smaller. And it went through a massive credit deleveraging that's ongoing. And that's exactly what's happening in the United States, is that the biggest component of the economy called the consumer is deleveraging. That's what's held back the economy despite all the stimulus. So, so far, the household sector has paid down or walked away from delevered roughly $1 trillion. And if we're talking about the concept of mean reversion, and mean reversion is very important in this business, and we're talking about taking debt to asset and debt to income ratios back to their pre-bubble norms, which I believe is going to happen, you're talking about another at least $3 trillion of deleveraging. And the question is going to be, is the fiscal policy outlook and is the monetary policy outlook going to survive long enough to act as an ongoing antidote to this deleveraging cycle. And how long do deleveraging cycles last? Well, I have this old saying, when in doubt, rely on somebody else's work. And McKinsey, the McKinsey Group, did this work two years ago where they found that, you know, you could have the assumption of a plain vanilla garden variety cycle, in which case we'd be off to the races by now, but we're not. Or if you've had a credit and asset shock, remember home prices in the US went down 35% this cycle, went down more than did in the 1930s. Working through these asset and credit cycles takes roughly seven years. So we finished two, and I'm gonna be optimistic, only five more to go. Ian Bremer of the Eurasia Group, you're up next for the final opening statement. So 95% of you say you're willing to change your mind. Paul said he doesn't believe half of you. That's because he thinks he's still in the States. <laughs> uh, last I read, the proposition was on North America. Some of us think it's 51st state up here. But I do want to mention Canada. I'll save it for the end. I, I, I know, best for last, best for last. Um, but let me, let me say, to start, that I understand why there's negativity here. Rudd, you mentioned, we're very concerned. We're concerned about the world. The architecture isn't working the way it used to. And that architecture, let's face it, was created after World War II by the United States. I know we call it the World Bank. It sounds global. We call it the World Series, too. <laughs> there is a Canadian team, but we know the truth. Uh, there is creative destruction happening in the global environment today, and we don't like that. And if we had a choice, and if, frankly, if we had a choice as Americans, to go back to when all that architecture was functioning well, all that American-made architecture, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we might say that's a more comfortable world. But that's not what we're debating. What we are debating is about whether or not the world we are in now is one that we can feel good about, and where. Where are we going to invest? Where are we going to live? And where do we want to give our kids a chance to make their mark? That's a relative game. And Larry and I bet firmly on North America, and we bet firmly on the States. Why do we do that? Well, where else are you going? <laughs> I mean, 
I look at Europe, and there are 17 nations in the Eurozone, and they talk about fiscal unity. That's not the problem in Europe in terms of governance. The problem in Europe is there is no kids' table. 17 countries. When I was a kid, you did not give me sharp utensils because the family pet would have been damaged, right? <laughs> That's changed recently. Uh, but in Europe, you've got Greece, you've got Italy, you've got 17 countries. They all have breakable glassware. That doesn't make sense. But that's going to take years, decades. Paul Krugman just came out and said it's ending not with a bang, but with bunga bunga. <laughs> I read that piece and I'm like, wow, well, he wouldn't go to Europe. How about Japan? 17 prime ministers in 22 years. That is a modern day Asian record if you don't include military coups in Thailand, which I am not want to do. For 50 years, they had a single party system. The LDP. Suddenly it's gone. But they don't have public policy schools. The Democratic Party of Japan doesn't know how to govern. That's why they're going through so many prime ministers right now. They don't have connections with the bureaucrats that actually understand policy, nor do they have connections with Japanese industrialists. You're not betting on Japan. How about China? You know what? You guys did that debate already. I saw it. I know how you voted. You're not betting on a Chinese century. You're not betting on a Chinese era. Why? Because it's massively volatile. They've got to move from a state capitalist system to a consumption-led system. They have to not only change their economic system, they have to adapt their political system. Maybe they can do it. 1.3 billion people, never done it before. Maybe. Kick a flyer on that, I'd put 5% of my portfolio. I wouldn't invest in nest egg. That's crazy. Now, the United States has problems. I'm not standing here. Larry and I are not here saying that we don't have problems. What we're saying, I mean, sure, deficit issues, unemployment issues, governance issues. We're not happy with where Congress is right now, but there's a difference between that and fear-mongering around it. You look at the United States right now, and even in terms of governance, we all went crazy. Oh, the debt limit's going to explode. And then, of course, at the last minute, they pull out a deal. We're saying the same thing right now. Nine days down the road, we're going to have the super committee. It's going to explode. We'll get our $1.2 trillion. It's going to be ugly. It's not a great way to govern. But it's better than what we see in Japan, Europe, or China. Look, am I nuts? Don't answer that. <laughs> and, and, and my... There, there's an easy way to look at this. It's called the dollar. Where do people go in all of this time of concern? In all of this time of 95% of Canadians going to change their mind, they go to the dollar or they go to gold. And you know what? Last I checked, gold isn't a country. <laughs> now, look, I said I want to spend a little time on Canada. I woke up this morning, I got the Globe and Mail delivered to my room, and on the front it says that the Prime Minister stands by Obama but looks to Asia. Smart thing to do, he's in Honolulu. <laughs> but Canada can hedge. Canada's got the United States, but British Columbia, as of May, selling more timber to China than to the United States. Energy goes everywhere. You don't do Keystone, you build out infrastructure. Last time I was in Calgary, the Chinese were doing everything possible to get in and buy, buy, buy. Mexico is a bet on the U.S. Whether it's trade or remittances or drugs, Canada's not. Does anyone here believe Canada's really entering a lost era? I don't buy it. Thank you. You're listening to the Monk Debate on the North American Economy, held in Toronto in mid-November 2011. The question was, North America faces a Japan-style era of high unemployment and slow growth. Do you agree or disagree? Assembled at Roy Thompson Hall in Toronto were a distinguished group of economic thinkers. On the pro side, Nobel laureate Paul Krugman, and David Rosenberg, a Canadian financial strategist. On the con side, former U.S. Treasury Secretary Lawrence Summers and Ian Bremmer, a consultant and author. And you're hearing all of this on Ideas on CBC Radio 1, on Sirius Satellite Radio 159, and around the world on the web. I'm Paul Kennedy. 
The debate, which turned out to be a referendum on the American economy, was moderated by Rudyard Griffiths. Back to some highlights from the evening. Let's change up uh, gears before we go to questions from the floor. And Ian, I want to start with you, and I want to talk about the Occupy Wall Street movement. It's here in Canada. One of its major grievances, obviously, is the inequality of wealth that we see uh, in this continent. And I think that's a grievance that's shared by a lot of people on both sides of the political spectrum, maybe not in America, but here uh, in Canada. So why isn't that really an Achilles heel for North America going forward? It's a, pro it's a growing problem in Canada, too. And the inequalities that are spawned from it, why isn't that something that will just fundamentally impede growth for a considerable period of time? Why wasn't Katrina an Achilles heel? I went to Tulane undergrad down New Orleans, and it is horrifying what happened there, and we said never again, and we keep saying it uh, every time I go down every year, and it doesn't get fixed. But the fact is the United States is an extraordinarily and exceptionally resilient system. Why did the elections in 2000, which 50% of the population believed were fraudulent, why didn't that cause chaos in the streets? I mean, if that had happened in Indonesia or Ukraine, it did happen in Ukraine, actually, it, very different responses, right? Um, and it's because the United States has extraordinary depths of political resilience and stability. In that regard, they're actually related to Japan. No question, Fukushima. Um, resilience is there, but unlike Japan, the U.S. also has the potential to actually grow and, and create and creative destruction and all the rest. So Occupy Wall Street is an embarrassment for the United States. There's no question. But the fact that we are debating as vigorously as we are and that these movements are happening across the country and they're mattering. No question to me that one of the reasons the $5 a month charge for ATM cards, which was not exactly good timing on the part of the banks, got pulled apart. It wasn't because Washington mandated it. It was because you had folks on the streets that said, we're not going to take this sort of thing. They, wow, this is maybe bad for us, right? I think that's a strength of the United States. I don't think it's a weakness, but clearly it needs to be addressed. Mm. But, Paul, look, you've written extensively about yeah, this. So. Um, I, the inequality, I think, per se, I mean, it, it, uh, it is possible to actually have full employment producing luxury goods, right? I mean, it's not, it's not essentially impossible to grow with inequality, but I think the inequality plays an indirect role in, fa in fact getting in the way. A lot of our political polarization, a lot of the, the pulling apart of our political system appears to be related to inequality. You know, political scientists have, have shown that those two track each other pretty closely. I also think a lot of the way we got into this mess was through a reckless deregulation, through a failure to, to, uh, to rein, rein in the, the financial sector, a, a sort of determined forgetting of the lessons of the 1930s, which never at any point actually worked very well. We never actually had a particularly successful economy. And yet there was this impression um, in Washington and in New York and among people who had influence that this was working just great. And the answer was, actually, yes, it was for them. That this, the, the 30 years following uh, the big change in America, the big shift to the right, uh, were actually not a good time for the American middle class family, but they were great for the top 0.1%. And so I think inequality uh, has, in effect, warped the perspective of our policy elites and continues to do so, because a lot of the things we need to do, like highly expansionary monetary policy, well, you know, it's, it, to the extent that, that they, we're thinking about the, the interests of workers, that would really, really help. If you think about the interests of bondholders, the Rantier class, uh, not so much. So I, I don't think inequality is crucial because I, I think the U.S. and Japan are actually, our macroeconomic experiences are actually alarmingly similar. And the Japanese managed to do it without all of this inequality. But it is a weakness. So yes, we have, we don't have some of their weaknesses, but we have different weaknesses of our own. And, and inequality is one of them. David, what's your take on this? I mean, does inequality lead to the potential for political crisis in North America, similar to what we're seeing in Europe? I mean, could we ever see people in the streets like we do in Greece or maybe in Rome someday soon? Well, I, I don't want to go that far, but it does lead to uh, social instability. I mean, Larry Summers mentioned about uh, the deficiency of aggregate demand. Everything, I mean, our, you know, our opponents haven't mentioned the word deleveraging, uh, haven't mentioned how, how housing fits in. Uh, what the root cause of the demand deficiency has been. What's the root cause? Because if we don't agree on the root cause, then we're not going to come to a, a solution. And so what's happened is that partly because of the fact that you have about 20 million Americans that are upside down on their mortgage, they get a job offer in Boston, they can't leave San Francisco unless they write their lender a check. So we've also had 
just that's just one example among a myriad of, of how housing and credit are played in to unemployment. And so when you have a situation, for example, where almost half of the ranks of the unemployed have been searching fruitlessly for work for at least six months, uh, you know, what's going to happen with these people? When you have a youth unemployment rate in the United States of 24 uh, percent, adult male unemployment rate of eight and a half percent, and if you don't have a college education, it's 14 percent. Um, I mean, everything ultimately will come right down to employment. So you have a lot of disenfranchised individuals with a lot of idle time and perhaps uh, not a lot of prospects because we're past the peak of the stimulus cycle, whether it pertains to federal fiscal policy or monetary policy. So I think, let me I'll just finish this point, yeah. uh, and hopefully you'll agree with me. Uh, but um, you never know. I'm wondering, you know, we're just basically writing different chapters of this book on the age of deleveraging. And I, I don't want to sound uh, alarmist in terms of, you know, will there be riots in the streets? Um, but uh, the longer you have uh, a serious unemployment problem in the U.S., and we're not even in a technical recession, we're supposedly in the third year of a statistical recovery, and, and it's not just a 9% unemployment rate when you count in all the underemployment, because you have so many people working part-time, they used to work full-time, the real unemployment rate, as you well know, yeah. is over 16%. That's, if the, the longer that lingers, uh, the more the risk of some sort of social instability uh, can possibly ensue. I'll, and I'll just say, by the way, uh, on, on this um, Occupy whatever street, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't know what the, if there is really a consistent message, but I'll tell you that there is one thing that, that resonates through the group, um, is that I think it's a backlash against excessive CEO pay in the United States. The fact that you had people running banks, or even today you hear of a CEO that's forced out by the board and they get this enormous pay package at a time where over 40 million people are receiving food stamps. Uh, it sort of um, leaves a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. So I think it comes more down to the golden parachutes, as far as I'm concerned. Another thing is what, if there's a common thread through this, that's really what it is. Paul, I just want to say quickly, quickly one other part. Look, look. Well, Larry, come and then I'll give uh, Paul the last word. Maybe I should let him talk and give me the last word. <laughs> uh, Either way. Uh, look, uh, the trend towards more inequality is a highly problematic thing. Too much of it has to do with uh, people who've successfully managed to get the government to directly or indirectly give them resources. There's much that needs to be done, starting with more progressive uh, uh, taxation and a variety of regulatory changes. On the other hand, let's remember there is another aspect to this, which is not by any means the whole story. It may not be half the story, but is worth keeping in mind here. Suppose the United States had 30 more people like Steve Jobs. Would that be good or would that be bad? I think it would be good, but the level of inequality in the United States would be significantly higher. And so we do need to recognize that a component of this inequality is the other side of successful entrepreneurship, and that is surely something we want to encourage. Now, too much of the inequality comes from other things, but let's not forget that some of the great fortunes have been made doing things that have had very substantial benefits for large numbers of North Americans and people around the world. Wow. I, yeah, I, I don't, we don't want to get too far into that. I think this is, this is correct, but actually almost none, almost none of your top 1% are people like that. They're very important, the few who are, but there are very few of them. Um, I just wanted to say, in case it wasn't clear, I, I think Occupy Wall Street has been an entirely positive development. It's been entirely salutary. Um, even uh, people ask, where does it go? It has already changed the discussion, and it's changed the discussion in a favorable way. We've stopped talking about, uh, we stopped, we've actually stopped talking quite so much about inflicting pain and more about creating jobs. So the Occupy Wall Street has actually moved me marginally towards Larry's position, giving me some hope that maybe, maybe there are resources uh, in, in the American psyche that will get us out of this. 
but then I turn on and watch another GOP debate and I change my mind. <laughs> well, let's go to another uh, audience question. It's my pleasure to call on my former Business News Network colleague and anchor, uh, Kim Parley, for her question. Kim. Thank you. Um, selfishly, I'd like to turn the conversation to Canada, if I could for a moment, and uh, similar to Ed Clark, ask you about some policy prescriptions, but for Canada. Context, of course, you all know this. Canada is a commodity and resource dependent economy. 85% of our exports go to the states. So given your views on what is happening with the states over the next years, what should Canada do today uh, from a prescriptive policy standpoint and something specific, if you could, immigration, tax, trade tariffs, to either protect itself from what's going to be happening or to take advantage of some growth that might be happening. So we're going to ask each of you for your big Canadian idea. And uh, <laughs> I'm going to start uh, with you first, Ian. And just, gentlemen, if we can be brief, I want to be conscious of our time. So, Ian, you're first. Well, I'd build out the polar north, number one. I mean, I bet on climate change. No one's going to fix that. Uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd go short Panama, I'd go long Canada on that one. You guys have icebreakers. America doesn't do that. Um, you know, I, I go to Calgary a fair amount, uh, and, uh, you know, I, the questions I get is, when, when is the United States going to start getting freaked out by the Chinese coming in and investing equity stakes and all the rest? And the answer is soon. Uh, and, and so be proactive. Uh, be proactive. I mean, you've got Keystone that just got pushed. Uh, and it'll come back after the elections, but this is a great opportunity if you're Canadian to say, wow, we need to really make sure that we're diversified and take advantage of the other countries out there that are growing a lot that want access to our commodities. Don't get sort of too in bed with them. The Brazilians understand this on land, right? I mean, there are, there are strings. There's conditionality that comes with China, just like there's conditionality that comes with the United States. You're not going to like that conditionality either. You're not Australia here, right? Which is all Canada, all, the, all China all the time. But take advantage of that hedge, get out there front. Great, thank you. Larry. You're part of a world that's slower. That means you're gonna to need to provide more demand. That goes to your monetary policies. That goes to uh, your fiscal policies. That goes to uh, your financial uh, policies. Recognize that you're gonna to need to sustain demand and there's risks to what the global economy is gonna bring you in terms of demand. Thankfully, our interest rates aren't at zero yet, so we've got a little bit of got room. a little bit of room, and I was, that actually plays right to what I was going to say. Hang on to your independent currency. What a, what a, what a great thing it is. Uh, um, so no, uh, no to the Amero. Uh, no, no, that's right. No to the there. Amero. No, no you, you keep your own dollar. Gives you a crucially needed flexibility. The two, the two standout economies of the advanced world in terms of getting through this relatively okay are actually Canada and Sweden. And both of them have the interesting feature of being countries that are on the edge of a large currency union but have kept their own currencies, which has given them crucial flexibility. Now, David, as a Canadian, you're, you're going to have to deliver here. What's your big oh. idea? You know, there's, uh, what's the, the old real estate saying, location, location, and location. And uh, we can't, uh, we have the location right next to the U.S. So, um, you know, the sort of things that we could do uh, to limit any potential economic damage is that there is uh, substantial room on the federal fiscal side to stimulate uh, if need be, uh, as we saw in, in the last cycle. But, you know, if this turns into a gut-wrenching global recession, everybody's going to be affected. What I, what I think is interesting, and uh, you know, I hear about that we haven't diversified enough from the U.S., but in some ways we really have, and especially when it comes to our capital markets, because half of the uh, stock market uh, valuation in this country is hitched to commodities, and that's really more of a play on emerging Asia and on China, because the U.S. is not the marginal buyer of commodities, hasn't been for decades, it's the marginal buyer of services. I actually quite encouragingly I look at Canada, you know, and, and there's no such thing as decoupling and we're not totally insulated, but, you know, once again, the old proof of the puddings in the eating, you know, we had a uh, U.S. recession in 2001, it was a tech wreck recession. Canada did not have a recession, 2001, 2002, we did not have a recession. Uh, and what's interesting is that the U.S. recession started in uh, December 2007. And very quickly thereafter, the U.S. stock market went down 20%. Our market went up 20% to a new high. Uh, 
we didn't start a recession for about seven, eight months later. And so it really was only when it stopped being a U.S. recession and became a global recession, and China went down for the count, and trade finance vanished, and it was really opened up the trap door. But it is interesting that we have made actually great strides to wean ourselves off um, the full effects of a U.S. recession. We proved it in 2001, and at least for the first seven, eight months of that U.S. recession before it became global in nature, we actually achieved that as well. Let's go to our final question tonight. It's uh, from someone who's a scholar, a professor at the University of Toronto, and the former leader of the Liberal Party of Canada. Michael Ignatieff, you're up next. I wanted to focus discussion on one issue that has recurred throughout, which is political gridlock and dysfunction in Washington, and there seems to be some disagreement with the panel about how serious that is, how serious an impediment to growth and recovery it is. Uh, I'm wondering whether I can focus that out as a question. What would be the advice of the panel to an incoming president in November 2012, whoever it is, to make the political system work more effectively to develop growth and jobs for the American economy? What's the single thing the president has to do uh, to deal with the political a dysfunction in the American political system. So, great segue from the big idea for Canada to the big idea uh, for the United States. And uh, Paul, let me start with you. Um, so I guess part, a lot of it depends on, on which party the president is from. And, and if, you're, if it is a Republican, I think he will have no trouble pushing through a lot of really, really destructive ideas. Um, <laughs> um, if President Obama is re-elected, um, he's, going, he's going to have to really use every parliamentary, every administrative trick available. He's going to have to do, uh, if, if the Democrats actually do regain control of the House and, and retain a majority in the Senate, which is within the realm of the possible, then he's going to have to use whatever tools are available, reconciliation. He's going to have to find a way to break that 60-vote um, rule. If the Democrats... Uh, fail to control one or both houses of Congress, he's going to have to do whatever he does in ways that, that essentially uh, use the powers of the president to bypass Congress. There's only so much you can do. Uh, the, 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 the gridlock in the U.S. system is not something that's small. It's not something that's petty. We've got a deep philosophical difference between the two parties. They fundamentally disagree on not only on how things work, but on, on morality, on what is right and wrong. And, and the idea that you can somehow finesse that or somehow if you say the right words, it'll go away, it won't. So the, the next president, uh, or the, the continuation of the present president, uh, is going to have to find a way to get stuff done despite that, which is going to be very, very hard. Ian, I'll go to you next. Well, let me answer. It's a big question. Let me give you try, I'll try to give you a big picture idea on it, which is that um, the United States as a, as a power has never been considered the same way other countries have, either by itself or by others. It's the indispensable nation, the exceptional nation. And I think that whether it's Romney or Obama, they need to understand both sides of that coin. That's the way they can lead. And uh, fundamentally, all of this amounts to leadership. You need a president that's seen as a leader by his colleagues, by his opposition. Someone that, you know, when Clinton was out there, right, people were like, you know, whether or not we could deal with him, whether or not we like him, he's a leader. We're going to we're gonna have to go in and fight but get something done. Uh, I think Obama's done a great job in understanding how the United States has eroded a lot of credibility on things like whether it's human rights or rule of law or free markets or accounting firms and gold standards, all of that. He's done a great job on that, but he's done a really bad job in understanding what American exceptionalism is. There's no Obama doctrine. Romney, on the other hand, and let's face it, it's going to be Romney, right? Um, we, no, we, we know that. I mean, there's not much choice. Um, <laughs> Uh, R Romney has, you know, in his foreign policy speeches and his big in his big think pieces, has focused on uh, the, you know, the Reagan era and U.S. exceptionalism and indispensability. But he's absolutely paid no attention to everything that's happened in the last ten years that have eroded it. They have to meet on this. So anyone that wants to be a leader, the president of the quote unquote free world, we don't hear that term very much anymore has to actually find a way to bridge those two things. That's how you make America not just great again, but ha have politicians understand that America is great again. We have to get that right. Good. Well said. David, uh, you lived and worked in the United States for a while. It's 
big part of your business now. What's your, what's your big idea for the U.S.? Well, uh, you know, I would just say an answer to the to the question about uh, about the gridlock is uh, that if Hank Paulson can go down on one knee and beg Nancy Pelosi to pass TARP for the second time, I imagine anything must be possible. <laughs> so that, that's, my, that's my reason for hope. Uh, my, my sense is that, and maybe it's a concern, is that it's hard to believe that, that what happened back then was you had a Republican president um, that was actually a lame duck president that actually ended up working effectively with Congress uh, to get something done. Unfortunately, it took a crisis uh, to push them into considered action. And, and maybe we have to live through a crisis again to really get these people in Washington moving in the same direction again. Larry, last word to you. Look, uh, it obviously makes a difference whether it's a Republican president or a Democratic president, uh, re-election of President Obama, and I obviously have a very strong view about which would be better uh, for America. But forced to answer the question in general terms, I'd answer it this way. I think our employment, our output, and our macroeconomic problems are of a magnitude that everyone has to move beyond what I call now more than everism. There is a strong tendency for both parties to have agendas. And I think the prospects of coming together on effective solutions are enhanced if we can define the central problem not as finding everything America needs, but as responding to the seriousness of the current recession. And my guess is that Keynes actually had this right. Keynes said that it was very important, critically important, to raise demand along the lines of the fiscal and monetary policies we spoke of. He also spoke of the importance of enhancing business confidence and pursuing a set of policies that would strengthen business confidence because that would increase investment. And if we can borrow those two ideas, which together span a significant part of the American political tradition, I think the new pres next presidential term can be one of significant improvement in the American economy. On Ideas, you've been listening to the Monk Debate on the North American Economy, held in Toronto in mid-November 2011. The debaters, all celebrated economic thinkers, were Paul Krugman, David Rosenberg, Laurent Summers, and Ian Bremmer. The debate was moderated by Rudyard Griffiths. The Monk Debates are an initiative of the ARIA Foundation, a charitable organization founded in 2006 by Peter and Melanie Monk to support Canadian institutions in the study and development of public policy. The producer for Ideas, Richard Handler. Technical Operations, Tim Lorimer and Dave Field. The executive producer of Ideas is Bernie Lucht, and I'm Paul Kennedy. Please stay tuned now to CBC Radio 1 and to Sirius Satellite Radio for the hourly news.